A Long and Illustrious History Chapter Contents Early Britain The Middle Ages The Tudors and Stuarts A Global Power The Twentieth Century Britain since 1945 Early Britain The first people to live in Britain were hunter-gatherers in what we call the Stone Age. For much of the Stone Age, Britain was connected to the continent by a land bridge. People came and went, following the herds of deer and horses which they hunted. Britain only became permanently separated from the continent by the Channel about 10,000 years ago. The first farmers arrived in Britain 6,000 years ago. The ancestors of these first farmers probably came from southeast Europe. These people built houses, tombs and monuments on the land. One of these monuments, Stonehenge, still stands in what is now the English county of Wiltshire. Stonehenge was probably a special gathering place for seasonal ceremonies. Other Stone Age sites have also survived. Scarabray on Orkney, off the north coast of Scotland, is the best preserved prehistoric village in northern Europe and has helped archaeologists to understand more about how people lived near the end of the Stone Age. Around 4,000 years ago, people learned to make bronze. We call this period the Bronze Age. People lived in round houses and buried their dead in tombs called round barrows. The people of the Bronze Age were accomplished metal workers who made many beautiful objects in bronze and gold, including tools, ornaments and weapons. The Bronze Age was followed by the Iron Age, where people learned how to make weapons and tools out of iron. People still lived in roundhouses, grouped together into larger settlements, and sometimes defended sites called hill forts. A very impressive hill fort can still be seen today at Maiden Castle, in the English county of Dorset. Most people were farmers, craft workers or warriors. The language they spoke was part of the Celtic language family. Similar languages were spoken across Europe in the Iron Age, and related languages are still spoken today in some parts of Wales, Scotland and Ireland. The people of the Iron Age had a sophisticated culture and economy. They made the first coins to be minted in Britain, some inscribed with the names of Iron Age kings. This marks the beginnings of British history. The Romans Julius Caesar led a Roman invasion of Britain in 55 BC. This was unsuccessful, and for nearly a hundred years, Britain remained separate from the Roman Empire. In AD 43, the Emperor Claudius led the Roman army in a new invasion. This time, there was resistance from some of the British tribes, but the Romans were successful in occupying almost all of Britain. One of the tribal leaders who fought against the Romans was Boudicca, the Queen of the Iceni, in what is now eastern England. She is still remembered today and there is a statue of her on Westminster Bridge in London, near the Houses of Parliament. Areas of what is now Scotland were never conquered by the Romans, and the Emperor Hadrian built a wall in the north of England to keep out the Picts, ancestors of the Scottish people. Included in the wall were a number of forts. Parts of Hadrian's wall, including the forts of Housesteads and Vindolanda, can still be seen. It is a popular area for walkers and is a UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation, World Heritage Site. The Romans remained in Britain for 400 years. They built roads and public buildings, created a structure of law and introduced new plants and animals. It was during the 3rd and 4th centuries AD that the first Christian communities began to appear in Britain. The Anglo-Saxons, 
The Roman army left Britain in AD 410 to defend other parts of the Roman Empire and never returned. Britain was again invaded by tribes from northern Europe, the Jutes, the Angles and the Saxons. The languages they spoke are the basis of modern-day English. Battles were fought against these invaders, but by about AD 600, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were established in Britain. These kingdoms were mainly in what is now England. The burial place of one of the kings was at Sutton Hoo in modern Suffolk. This king was buried with treasure and armour, all placed in a ship, which was then covered by a mound of earth. Parts of the west of Britain, including much of what is now Wales and Scotland, remained free of Anglo-Saxon rule. The Anglo-Saxons were not Christians when they first came to Britain, but during this period, missionaries came to Britain to preach about Christianity. Missionaries from Ireland spread the religion in the north. The most famous of these was St Patrick, who would become the patron saint of Ireland, and St Columba, who founded a monastery in the island of Iona, off the coast of what is now Scotland. St Augustine led missionaries from Rome, who spread Christianity in the south. St Augustine became the first Archbishop of Canterbury. The Vikings The Vikings came from Denmark and Norway. They first visited Britain in AD 789 to raid coastal towns and take away goods and slaves. Then they began to stay and form their own communities in the east of England and Scotland. The Anglo-Saxon kingdoms in England united under King Alfred the Great, who defeated the Vikings. Many of the Viking invaders stayed in Britain, especially in the east and north of England, in an area known as the Danelaw. Many place names there, such as Grimsby and Scunthorpe, come from the Viking languages. The Viking settlers mixed with local communities, and some converted to Christianity. Anglo-Saxon kings continued to rule what is now England, except for a short period where there were Danish kings. The first of these was Knut, also called Canute. In the north, the threat of attack by Vikings had encouraged the people to unite under one king, Kenneth MacAlpin. The term Scotland began to be used to describe that country. The Norman Conquest in 1066, an invasion led by William, the Duke of Normandy, in what is now northern France, defeated Harold, the Saxon King of England, at the Battle of Hastings. Harold was killed in the battle. William became King of England and is known as William the Conqueror. The battle is commemorated in a great piece of embroidery known as the Bayeux Tapestry, which can still be seen in France today. The Norman Conquest was the last successful foreign invasion of England and led to many changes in government and social structures in England. Norman French, the language of the new ruling class, influenced the development of the English language as we know it today. Initially, the Normans also conquered Wales, but the Welsh gradually won territory back. The Scots and the Normans fought on the border between England and Scotland. The Normans took over some land on the border, but did not invade Scotland. William sent people all over England to draw up lists of all the towns and villages. The people who lived there, who owned the land and what animals they owned, were also listed. This was called the Doomsday Book. It still exists today and gives a picture of society in England just after the Norman Conquest. Check that you understand the history of the UK before the Romans, the impact of the Romans on British society, the different groups that invaded after the Romans, the importance of the Norman invasion in 1066. The Middle Ages War at home and abroad. The period after the Norman Conquest, up until about 1485, 
is called the Middle Ages, or the Medieval Period. It was a time of almost constant war. The English kings fought with the Welsh, Scottish and Irish noblemen for control of their lands. In Wales, the English were able to establish their rule. In 1284, King Edward I of England introduced the Statute of Rudlan, which annexed Wales to the Crown of England. Huge castles, including Conwy and Carnarvon, were built to maintain this power. By the middle of the 15th century, the last Welsh rebellions had been defeated. English laws and the English language were introduced. In Scotland, the English kings were less successful. In 1314, the Scottish, led by Robert the Bruce, defeated the English at the Battle of Bannockburn, and Scotland remained unconquered by the English. At the beginning of the Middle Ages, Ireland was an independent country. The English first went to Ireland as troops to help the Irish king and remained to build their own settlements. By 1200, the English ruled an area of Ireland known as the Pale, around Dublin. Some of the important lords in other parts of Ireland accepted the authority of the English king. During the Middle Ages, the English kings also fought a number of wars abroad. Many knights took part in the Crusades, in which European Christians fought for control of the Holy Land. English kings also fought a long war with France, called the Hundred Years' War, even though it actually lasted 116 years. One of the most famous battles of the Hundred Years' War was the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, where King Henry V's vastly outnumbered English army defeated the French. The English left France in the 1450s. The Black Death The Normans used a system of land ownership known as feudalism. The king gave land to his lords in return for help in war. Landowners had to send certain numbers of men to serve in the army. Some peasants had their own land, but most were serfs. They had a small area of their lord's land where they could grow food. In return, they had to work for their lord and could not move away. The same system developed in southern Scotland. In the north of Scotland and Ireland, land was owned by members of the clans, prominent families. In 1348, a disease, probably a form of plague, came to Britain. This was known as the Black Death. One third of the population of England died, and a similar proportion in Scotland and Wales. This was one of the worst disasters ever to strike Britain. Following the Black Death, the smaller population meant there was less need to grow cereal crops. There were labour shortages, and peasants began to demand higher wages. New social classes appeared, including owners of large areas of land, later called the gentry, and people left the countryside to live in the towns. In the towns, growing wealth led to the development of a strong middle class. In Ireland, the Black Death killed many in the Pale, and for a time, the area controlled by the English became smaller. Legal and political changes. In the Middle Ages, Parliament began to develop into the institution it is today. Its origins can be traced to the King's Council of Advisers, which included important noblemen and the leaders of the Church. There were few formal limits to the King's power until 1215. In that year, King John was forced by his noblemen to agree to a number of demands. The result was a Charter of Rights called the Magna Carta, which means the Great Charter. The Magna Carta established the idea that even the king was subject to the law. It protected the rights of the nobility and restricted the king's power to collect taxes or to make or change laws. In future, the king would need to involve his noblemen in decisions. In England, Parliaments were called for the king to consult his nobles, particularly when the king needed to raise money. The numbers attending Parliament increased, 
and two separate parts, known as houses, were established. The nobility, great landowners and bishops, sat in the House of Lords. Knights, who were usually smaller landowners, and wealthy people from towns and cities, were elected to sit in the House of Commons. Only a small part of the population was able to join in electing the members of the Commons. A similar Parliament developed in Scotland. It had three houses called estates, the Lords, the Commons and the Clergy. This was also a time of development in the legal system. The principle that judges are independent of the government began to be established. In England, judges developed common law by a process of precedence, that is, following previous decisions and tradition. In Scotland, the legal system developed slightly differently and laws were codified, that is, written down. A distinct identity. The Middle Ages saw the development of a national culture and identity. After the Norman Conquest, the king and his noblemen had spoken Norman French, and the peasants had continued to speak Anglo-Saxon. Gradually, these two languages combined to become one English language. Some words in modern English, for example, park and beauty, are based on Norman French words. Others, for example, apple, cow and summer, are based on Anglo-Saxon words. In modern English, there are often two words with very similar meanings, one from French and one from Anglo-Saxon. Demand, French, and ask, Anglo-Saxon, are examples. By 1400, in England, official documents were being written in English, and English had become the preferred language of the royal court and parliament. In the years leading up to 1400, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote a series of poems in English about a group of people going to Canterbury on a pilgrimage. The people decided to tell each other stories on the journey, and the poems described the travellers and some of the stories they told. This collection of poems is called The Canterbury Tales. It was one of the first books to be printed by William Caxton, the first person in England to print books using a printing press. Many of the stories are still popular. Some have been made into plays and television programmes. In Scotland, many people continued to speak Gaelic and the Scots language also developed. A number of poets began to write in the Scots language. One example is John Barber, who wrote The Bruce, about the Battle of Bannockburn. The Middle Ages also saw a change in the type of buildings in Britain. Castles were built in many places in Britain and Ireland, partly for defence. Today, many are in ruins, although some, such as Windsor and Edinburgh, are still in use. Great cathedrals, for example Lincoln Cathedral, were also built and many of these are still used for worship. Several of the cathedrals had windows of stained glass, telling stories about the Bible and Christian saints. The glass in York Minster is a famous example. During this period, England was an important trading nation. English wool became a very important export. People came to England from abroad to trade and also to work. Many had special skills, such as weavers from France, engineers from Germany, glass manufacturers from Italy, and canal builders from Holland. The Wars of the Roses In 1455, a civil war was begun to decide who should be King of England. It was fought between the supporters of two families, the House of Lancaster and the House of York. This war was called the Wars of the Roses because the symbol of Lancaster was a red rose and the symbol of York was a white rose. The war ended with the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. King Richard III of the House of York was killed in the battle and Henry Tudor, the leader of the House of Lancaster, became King Henry VII. Henry then married King Richard's niece, Elizabeth of York, 
and united the two families. Henry was the first king of the House of Tudor. The symbol of the House of Tudor was a red rose with a white rose inside it, as a sign that the houses of York and Lancaster were now allies. Check that you understand the wars that took place in the Middle Ages, how Parliament began to develop, the way that land ownership worked, the effects of the Black Death, the development of English language and culture, the Wars of the Roses and the founding of the House of Tudor. The Tudors and Stuarts Religious Conflicts After his victory in the Wars of the Roses, Henry VII wanted to make sure that England remained peaceful and that his position as king was secure. He deliberately strengthened the central administration of England and reduced the power of the nobles. He was thrifty and built up the monarchy's financial reserves. When he died, his son, Henry VIII, continued the policy of centralising power. Henry VIII was most famous for breaking away from the Church of Rome and marrying six times. The Six Wives of Henry VIII Catherine of Aragon Catherine was a Spanish princess. She and Henry had a number of children, but only one, Mary, survived. When Catherine was too old to give him another child, Henry decided to divorce her, hoping that another wife would give him a son to be his heir. Anne Boleyn Anne Boleyn was English. She and Henry had one daughter, Elizabeth. Anne was unpopular in the country and was accused of taking lovers. She was executed at the Tower of London. Jane Seymour Henry married Jane after Anne's execution. She gave Henry the son he wanted, Edward, but she died shortly after the birth. Anne of Cleves Anne was a German princess. Henry married her for political reasons, but divorced her soon after. Catherine Howard Catherine was a cousin of Anne Boleyn. She was also accused of taking lovers and executed. Catherine Parr Catherine was a widow who married Henry late in his life. She survived him and married again but died soon after. To divorce his first wife, Henry needed the approval of the Pope. When the Pope refused, Henry established the Church of England. In this new church, the king, not the Pope, would have the power to appoint bishops and order how people should worship. At the same time, the Reformation was happening across Europe. This was a movement against the authority of the Pope and the ideas and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. The Protestants formed their own churches. They read the Bible in their own languages instead of in Latin. They did not pray to saints or at shrines. And they believed that a person's own relationship with God was more important than submitting to the authority of the church. Protestant ideas gradually gained strength in England, Wales and Scotland during the 16th century. In Ireland, however, attempts by the English to impose Protestantism alongside efforts to introduce the English system of laws about the inheritance of land, led to rebellion from the Irish chieftains, and much brutal fighting followed. During the reign of Henry VIII, Wales became formally united with England by the Act for the Government of Wales. The Welsh sent representatives to the House of Commons, and the Welsh legal system was reformed. Henry VIII was succeeded by his son Edward VI, who was strongly Protestant. During his reign, the Book of Common Prayer was written to be used in the Church of England. A version of this book is still used in some churches today. Edward died at the age of 15, after ruling for just over six years, and his half-sister Mary became queen. Mary was a devout Catholic and persecuted Protestants. For this reason, she became known as Bloody Mary. Mary also died after a short reign, 
and the next monarch was her half-sister, Elizabeth, the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Queen Elizabeth I Queen Elizabeth I was a Protestant. She re-established the Church of England as the official church in England. Everyone had to attend their local church, and there were laws about the type of religious services and the prayers which could be said. But Elizabeth did not ask about people's real beliefs. She succeeded in finding a balance between the views of Catholics and the more extreme Protestants. In this way, she avoided any serious religious conflict within England. Elizabeth became one of the most popular monarchs in English history, particularly after 1588, when the English defeated the Spanish Armada, a large fleet of ships, which had been sent by Spain to conquer England and restore Catholicism. The Reformation in Scotland and Mary Queen of Scots Scotland had also been strongly influenced by Protestant ideas. In 1560, the predominantly Protestant Scottish Parliament abolished the authority of the Pope in Scotland and Roman Catholic religious services became illegal. A Protestant Church of Scotland with an elected leadership was established, but unlike in England, this was not a state church. The Queen of Scotland, Mary Stuart, often now called Mary Queen of Scots, was a Catholic. She was only a week old when her father died and she became Queen. Much of her childhood was spent in France. When she returned to Scotland, she was the centre of a power struggle between different groups. When her husband was murdered, Mary was suspected of involvement and fled to England. She gave her throne to her Protestant son, James VI of Scotland. Mary was Elizabeth I's cousin and hoped that Elizabeth might help her. But Elizabeth suspected Mary of wanting to take over the English throne and kept her a prisoner for twenty years. Mary was eventually executed, accused of plotting against Elizabeth I. Exploration, Poetry and Drama the Elizabethan period in England was a time of growing patriotism, a feeling of pride in being English. English explorers sought new trade routes and tried to expand British trade into the Spanish colonies in the Americas. Sir Francis Drake, one of the commanders in the defeat of the Spanish Armada, was one of the founders of England's naval tradition. His ship, the Golden Hind, was one of the first to sail right round circumnavigate the world. In Elizabeth I's time, English settlers first began to colonise the eastern coast of America. This colonisation, particularly by people who disagreed with the religious views of the next two kings, greatly increased in the next century. The Elizabethan period is also remembered for the richness of its poetry and drama, especially the plays and poems of William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare, 1564-1616 Shakespeare was born in Stratford-upon-Avon, England. He was a playwright and actor and wrote many poems and plays. His most famous plays include A Midsummer Night's Dream, Hamlet, Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet. He also dramatised significant events from the past but he did not focus solely on kings and queens. He was one of the first to portray ordinary English men and women. Shakespeare had a great influence on the English language and invented many words that are still common today. Lines from his plays and poems, which are often still quoted, include Once more unto the breach, Henry V. To be or not to be, Hamlet. A rose by any other name, Romeo and Juliet. All the world's a stage, as you like it. The darling buds of May, Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Many people regard Shakespeare as the greatest playwright of all time. 
His plays and poems are still performed and studied in Britain and other countries today. The Globe Theatre in London is a modern copy of the theatres in which his plays were first performed. James VI and First Elizabeth I never married, and so had no children of her own to inherit her throne. When she died in 1603, her heir was her cousin James VI of Scotland. He became King James I of England, Wales and Ireland, but Scotland remained a separate country. The King James Bible One achievement of King James's reign was a new translation of the Bible into English. This translation is known as the King James Version, or the Authorised Version. It was not the first English Bible, but is a version which continues to be used in many Protestant churches today. Ireland During this period, Ireland was an almost completely Catholic country. Henry VII and Henry VIII had extended English control outside the Pale and had established English authority over the whole country. Henry VIII took the title King of Ireland. English laws were introduced and local leaders were expected to follow the instructions of the Lord Lieutenants in Dublin. During the reigns of Elizabeth I and James I, many people in Ireland opposed rule by the Protestant government in England. There were a number of rebellions. The English government encouraged Scottish and English Protestants to settle in Ulster, the northern province of Ireland, taking over the land from Catholic landholders. These settlements were known as plantations. Many of the new settlers came from southwest Scotland, and other land was given to companies based in London. James later organised similar plantations in several other parts of Ireland. This had serious long-term consequences for the history of England, Scotland and Ireland. The Rise of Parliament Elizabeth I was very skilled at managing Parliament. During her reign, she was successful in balancing her wishes and views against those of the House of Lords and those of the House of Commons, which was increasingly Protestant in its views. James I and his son Charles I were less skilled politically. Both believed in the divine right of kings, the idea that the king was directly appointed by God to rule. They thought that the king should be able to act without having to seek approval from Parliament. When Charles I inherited the thrones of England, Wales, Ireland and Scotland, he tried to rule in line with this principle. When he could not get Parliament to agree with his religious and foreign policies, he tried to rule without Parliament at all. For eleven years he found ways in which to raise money without Parliament's approval, but eventually trouble in Scotland meant that he had to recall Parliament.